Um, thank you very much for the, the very warm uh, welcome and thank you to all of you for uh, coming out on a rather uh, damp uh, Tuesday evening, and particularly to uh, think about Brexit. It's not necessarily the most uh, pleasurable uh, range of circumstances. Um, one of the chapters of the book, uh, Brexit Time, discusses the idea of differentiated Brexit. And that had a kind of territorial dimension, the idea that maybe Scotland, Remain voting Scotland and Northern Ireland would try and carve their own uh, or seek their own special deals. There was a kind of sectoral dimension to it, uh, the idea that different parts of the UK economy were exposed to Brexit in different ways. But the bit that I want to talk to you about tonight is really a more um, temporal dimension to, to Brexit. And that is the idea of a transitional arrangement for when the, the UK finally leaves the, the European Union. Before I turn, though, to the options for transitional arrangements, of which I think there are probably really four main ones, we need to think about why we might want or need any form of transitional framework. Uh, in the first place. And often we say, well, we need one to avoid a cliff edge or a hard Brexit. And of course, I guess we've all become used to the metaphors uh, around Brexit, some of which are helpful and others which perhaps uh, aren't so helpful. But what do we really mean by a, a, a hard Brexit and, and why, why might we want to avoid it? And I think it's particularly interesting that at the same time as we're hearing more and more about a discussion about the need for transition and transitional arrangements, at the same time we equally hear more about no deal and leaving without a deal, and as if these are sort of these are the kind of the, the two worlds we are we're inhabiting. So why would a hard Brexit or a no deal Brexit be a bad thing? For some, it may not be. The problem, as I see, it, is that we either fall into a situation where there are regulatory gaps because we wouldn't have an agreement or, or system in place to continue to secure market access. So things like aviation licenses, bank licenses, uh, medicines licenses. Um, so we wouldn't have those in, in, in place. Or that there are, there are rules that would be in place. There would be kind of default rules that would be in place, uh, but they would not be preferable, they would, be, they would be potentially damaging. And here, of course, we think about default rules in terms of defaulting to trade under WTO terms and the, the renewal of the imposition on tariffs and trade between the UK and the EU. Now, the important point to remember about a no deal is that it's not the same as defaulting to the status quo. It's often said that um, a no deal, the option of a no deal is a good bargaining tool, as if we were sort of bargaining to buy a carpet somewhere. Well, if you threaten to walk away from buying a carpet, the worst that happens is you don't have a carpet you didn't have in the first place. The problem with a no deal for the UK is that we don't default to the status quo ante we would default to a situation of either, as I say, regulatory gaps, there'd be things that we would need which we don't have, or default rules like the imposition of tariffs under the WTO. Now, what becomes clear then is that much of our debate about transitional arrangements is about the trade aspects, the trade and commercial aspects. These have become the dominant themes of how we think about Brexit. But of course, Brexit is more than commerce and trade. It is about uh, so, so much more than, than that. It's about the UK cutting itself off from other forms of uh, cooperation. And particularly important to us, I guess, would be the, the cooperation in areas like education and research, as well as things like security cooperation. There's clearly a politics to all of this, I think. There are those who simply want to leave the EU, and they're more likely to see 
um, an idea of a, a transitional arrangement as simply about foot dragging, as delaying the inevitable where in fact we should be getting on with it. On the other hand, maybe some soft levers and many remainers, for them, there are both short-term and uh, long-term economic risks of the UK simply crashing out of the EU without anything to take its place. Unsurprisingly, I think those who argue for a transitional framework are open to the accusation that they are, they are simply engaging in, in a foot-dragging dra exercise or, or even rerunning elements of, of the, the so-called project fear that we, there is too much of a, an emphasis on the risks and not enough on the opportunities. Whichever view you take, I think one has to nonetheless be clear that there are risks that arise if the UK has nothing in place when it leaves the EU. And the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee's uh, No Deal report did much to highlight, highlight them. I, together with um, some, some colleagues from the Bar Council, provided evidence to that committee, uh, um, and we highlighted some of those risks. Now, the idea, though, that the, uh, a transitional framework cannot be understood in purely instrumental terms is obvious, not least in the language itself. Government ministers continue to refer to a period of implementation rather than a transitional arrangement. There's a difficulty about even wanting to use the language. Again, we go back to metaphor and our, our linguistic construction of the problem of Brexit. So for some, it's not just about these instrumental concerns, but actually the language we're using and the government and government ministers have frequently refused and still refuse to talk about a transitional arrangement. The problem with talking about implementation period, of course, is you need something to implement. That's what we would normally casually think as, as an implementation period, once you had something to implement. Now, for many, I guess, who are on the, the, the leave side, the only thing that really needs to be implemented is the referendum result itself, that there is a mandate to leave, and it's for the, for the UK government to deliver on that and to deliver uh, the UK's withdrawal from the EU. But I think it serves to underline an, op an optimistic belief that the, uh, the UK will have, have put in place I think some of the key elements of, of a future deep and special partnership with the EU prior to its exit. And therefore, what might be implemented isn't just merely the referendum result, but that there will be this big negotiation which can take place within the Article 50 process, and that that will then be the thing that will then be uh, implemented thereafter. I don't think that's an understanding of transition which makes much sense either politically or legally. Politically, there is simply not enough time to conduct this sort of negotiation within the two-year Article 50 negotiation window. We are going to be lucky, I think, to have got past the first phase of negotiations uh, by the anniversary of the, the, the notification of our withdrawal from the EU. Legally, the position of the EU is that it will only conduct negotiations um, on the future uh, relationship between the UK and the EU formally once the UK has actually left the EU under the normal procedures that would apply whenever the EU negotiates an agreement with uh, non-member states. Now, the reality, of course, is that if there is nothing in place between Brexit and this future relationship that will be negotiated with the EU, then the default position will come into play. And that really will serve the interests of, of, of neither side, really. Nobody wants to see more barriers, more tariffs being created in the gap in between. And it's because I think that there is clearly an interest on both sides not to default to no deal that I think we need to talk seriously, not just about what a withdrawal agreement would look like in terms of finalising the settlement of the UK's really um, outstanding liabilities with the EU, etc. But we also need to think very seriously about what a transition would look like. What kind of bridges do we need between the moment of departure and any future agreement. 
Now, in his recent evidence that David Davis, the Brexit Secretary, gave to the, uh, the Brexit Select Committee, uh, David D Davis highlighted uh, three reasons for uh, having a, a period of implementation. He said, firstly, it's to give the UK government time to put in place structures and processes for life outside the EU. Secondly, it would be to allow uh, other national governments the same time to prepare for, its relation, for their relationships with the, the UK outside of the shared structures of the EU. And finally, to allow businesses to prepare in the knowledge of where the UK is heading, and so having some certainty in order to adjust once to Brexit. So these are his three rationales for why we might need this period of implementation, transitional period. Now, I think there are things we can quibble about this framing of, of why we might need um, transitional arrangements. Not least its failure to acknowledge the, the central motivation is to avoid the default uh, position that I've, I've described. But I think the first point he makes is a very important acknowledgement that the UK will have to be ready for Brexit. And that will include bringing back in-house many of the regulatory functions which have been shared with the EU during the UK's uh, membership of the European Union. The UK will also put in place customs arrangements and other regulatory arrangements ready for its exit from the EU. And that is going to take time. Not for nothing has the parliamentary session been extended to two years at the moment to try and get some of the legislation uh, through in time for Brexit, but there is a recognition that this may, may take longer. So I think there is at least a, a, a very honest acknowledgement that one reason for wanting transition is because the UK won't be ready. Now an important aspect of this preparation is of course the European Union Withdrawal Bill, which is currently before Parliament. The Pre, the bill previously known as the Great Repeal Bill. It's easy to overlook that this is itself a domestic transitional framework. Although the Leave campaign urged voters to take back control and to reassert the authority of UK institutions uh, in domestic decision-making, the reality is that the bill will seek to preserve existing EU law and convert any other EU law into domestic law in time for exit. It's a remarkable ambition to embed within our own law the, what is called the, the, the EU acquis, the whole body of rules and regulations which apply. And quite bizarrely, this also includes making the primacy of this so-called retained EU law, uh, the primacy of that law over domestic law, part of UK law. This is a feat that was never achieved in such express statutory terms during the UK's membership. It's a remarkable feature that at the moment that the UK leaves the EU, we entrench the primacy of this retained EU law in a domestic statute. So the bill intends to create what I would call a standstill, unless and until Parliament decides to change any of this retained EU law, it will be uh, a standstill position. Now creating this domestic legal transitional framework is a very complex constitutional and legal undertaking and you'll be aware that the bill is somewhat stuck at the moment because of the large number of amendments that have been uh, tacked onto it, some for good reasons, some for um, clearly political spoiler reasons. The bill is, in fairness to its drafters, trying to achieve something really quite remarkable, and it does it in quite a remarkable way. Um, there are problems with it, there will be difficulties with it, but nonetheless, it is trying to create this, this, this transitional framework. 
It can only, however, really deal with the regulatory side of things. It can only really put in place the things that will matter in terms of consumer protection or health protection or environmental protection. There were aspects of UK law prior to exit and will remain so during this transitional period. What it cannot reach, for understandable reasons, because it's purely a domestic act, what it cannot reach is how to secure market access for UK businesses in the uh, trade and goods and services across borders on terms that are similar or identical to what we have at the moment. You need an international agreement in place that will ensure that uh, tariff barriers will not be erected and that any non-tariff barriers are removed or eliminated as much as possible. That means that some type of EU level agreement would be required to try and keep things the same. Now in her Florence speech, the Prime Minister identified that the, she would seek what we would call it a transitional period or she would call an implementation period in which trade would be conducted on terms identical to as they are now. The question we need to ask is how? How would this actually come about? So one response might be, well, look at what the UK is doing. It's already domesticating all this EU law, putting it into its own law. Why can't the EU do something that will simply then do the same at EU level? The, UK, the EU cannot simply mirror the UK's um, domestic approach of simply keeping everything the same. If it did do that, it would, in effect, be maintaining the UK's membership of the EU. Moreover, the EU is not a sovereign body. It doesn't have the capacity to do anything it likes. It can only do certain things, and it can only do the things that the founding treaties allow it to do within the legal limits that are laid down. And I think this is perhaps one of the frustrations that the UK has in negotiating with the EU, which is, and particularly if those negotiations are being conducted by those who are very optimistic about the future, everything is possible from the UK side. But on the EU side, what is possible is what is legally permissible and operating under a mandate given by the other EU 27 states. And I think there is a bit of a clash of understanding as to how flexible the, the EU can actually be in legal terms. So the EU has been fairly cautious in its language in discussing possibilities for any kind of transitional framework. The way in which the Article 50 process works is that the European Council, that is the meetings of the heads of state, prime ministers, presidents, give draft gu guidelines for the, for the process. And those guidelines are then translated into more specific negotiating directives given to the European Commission, which is negotiating on behalf of the, the Union. Now, in its guidelines uh, to the, the union's negotiator, the European Council cautiously, I think, accepts the possibility of the negotiation of an interim framework as part of the Article 50 withdrawal process. But it says, to the extent necessary and legally possible, the negotiations may also seek to determine transitional arrangements which are in the interests of the union and, as appropriate, to provide for bridges towards the foreseeable framework for the future relationship in light of the progress made. You can, the caution drips off the, the, the page there in terms of what is legally possible, what is in the interest of the union. Compare that to David Davis's, well, we need transition because the the UK is not going to be ready. From the EU side, that's not its primary concern. The negotiating directives themselves are even more specific. It says any such transitional arrangements must be clearly defined, limited in time, 
subject to effective enforcement mechanisms, and should a time-limited, time-limited prolongation of the union a key be considered, this would require existing, existing union regulatory, budgetary, supervisory, judiciary and enforcement instruments and structures to apply. So, these are the political expressions. We understand why the UK might, what it wants. We understand politically what the, the union's negotiators are being asked to do. I guess I get the dirty job. I'm a lawyer. I'm supposed to work out how you actually do any of this. And today I have um, published a new paper where I try and sketch out what I think are, are four main options for the interim framework and to try and assess the, the, the legal limits and political limits to, to each of these options. So the four options that I think are, are at play are these. One is a standstill transition, something which tries to do some of what the, the, the UK's own withdrawal bill does in a way that would dovetail with it in a legally satisfactory way. The other is to try and put in place a kind of mini or scaled down version of the future framework, a kind of provisional type of arrangement, whether a trade arrangement or something called an association agreement, which are usually the types of agreement for forms of cooperation that include trade but go, go beyond trade. The third option is simply to defer departure. And the fourth option is some type of interim membership of the European Free Trade Association for the UK to go back to where it started prior to 1973 in the European Free Trade Association, but accessing the European single market through the European Economic Area Agreement. This is the kind of so-called Norway model. So, I want to try uh, to sketch out what I think these, these options uh, look like. Standstill. So the idea here would be for the withdrawal agreement to come into force. So the UK and the EU will negotiate its Article 15 withdrawal agreement and the UK would leave the EU and would cease to be a member state. But what I have in mind is this. The Article 50 tells us that the treaties cease to apply to a withdrawing state at the date of entry into force of the withdrawal agreement. It's kind of all or nothing. You're either in or you're out. And once the withdrawal agreement enters into force, you're then out. What I wonder is whether we can have a derogation. A derogation that saves certain of those provisions and would continue for them to be imposed on exactly the like current terms for a time-limited period. I think that is legally possible within the Article 50 framework. I think it's consistent with the Article 50 framework. I think it's very consistent with the union's view of transition, prolongation of the acquis. So in other words, certain provisions would be saved for a time-limited period. There'd be options for either side to remove the derogation so that it could fall apart. Or in any event, for a time-limited period, this would be in place. And once that period was over, then either we're into the new deep and special partnership, or we're not going anywhere with that. From the UK perspective, this would be a compromise. I think it would be important politically for the UK to say that it had delivered on the referendum, that the UK had left the EU and was not, for most purposes, a member state. 
and that the continued imposition of EU law was uh, limited to a set of very specific obligations and on a time-limited uh, basis. The difficulty might be, however, that that would then have to articulate with the UK's own withdrawal bill. Because the withdrawal bill operates on the, on the same idea as Article 50, that you're either in or you're out. That this body of, of retained EU law, the, the body of law that will be retained in UK law, is that body of law which existed up until the point where we left. That's how you define it. Exit day. It's that body of law. But if you're then going to prolong certain provisions of the treaties that would still continue to apply, you don't have a clean break. You don't have a clean exit day. And that would require UK legislation to have to then deal with three things. It would have to deal with the body of law that would be retained EU law up until the general exit day. Then it would have to deal with what you did in domestic legal terms to this new body of saved EU law, these specific provisions governing trade, for example, that would, would continue to apply. And then you have the enormous headache, which is the EU still continues to legislate including in the areas covered by the saved law, and what do you do about that? Do you also then include new rules and regulations that apply in the areas where the treaties would continue to apply? So it's going to make it somewhat difficult, I think, for the withdrawal bill. It's not impossible, but it, it complicates what was already a fairly complicated task. Nonetheless, my belief is that this still remains the most legally secure route in town for transition. It's consistent with the Article 50 process, I think. Um, it would be for a time-limited period, and I think it is just about workable. Key issue, of course, will be which provisions do you save and how extensive that would be. You might think, though, well, actually, let's be more ambitious than that. We're thinking about a future trade agreement or we're thinking about a closer form of cooperation in the form of an association agreement. Let's just try and have something that would get us towards that. If that's the end point, build a bridge to it. Create the mechanisms that would then get us there. It's a very attractive um, option. It is also legally a minefield. Bearing in mind what I said about the union's guidelines, which are cautious, thinking about a framework for future cooperation, but requiring that that future relationship only be legally established once the UK has actually left. That will require a period of negotiation. The danger is the more that you try and make a transitional arrangement look like the future, and, the more, and you, you're trying to negotiate that within the framework of Article 50, the more you risk stretching the limited powers that the EU has under Article 50. On the one hand, you look at Article 50 and you think, actually, the union has a very wide discretion. It's got quite a wide discretion, in fact, an extensive the, the EU's own institutions describe it as an unprecedentedly, exceptionally wide discretion in managing withdrawal. The problem is, though, that it cannot be a blank check. It cannot be stretched to the point that there are no legal limits on it. The EU is, as I say, a very conservative structure from that point of view, and, and that there are rightly member states insist that the union only acts within the limits of its powers. So I don't think even conceptually it has is a limitless power to do whatever you like. In more mundane terms, there are different procedural rules in play that would apply, for example, to the agreement of an association agreement. So a future association agreement, the, for example, the agreement that the EU did with the Ukraine requires the unanimous consent of all the member states. 
And because of the extensive nature of the cooperation, they are what are called mixed agreements. In other words, they engage not just the competencies of the union, but also the inherent powers of the member states. And that then requires domestic approval and ratification in the member states. So a procedural rule for an association agreement is unanimity and domestic approval and ratification. The Article 50 process allows decision by a majority vote, qualified majority vote, and as a matter of EU law, no domestic approval or ratification. And legally, you cannot combine these things in EU law. You couldn't have an agreement that was based on Article 50 and based on the provision of the treaty that deals with association agreements, which is Article 217. They're incompatible. The more that you try and create a new legal framework that is a mini version of the future, these problems arise. The EU is also unlikely to be attracted towards this because you would effectively be creating a new legal instrument, a new legal vehicle for the relationship between the EU and the UK. You're not just dealing with withdrawal. You're not just dealing with the central object of Article 50, which is to manage withdrawal. You're creating a new legal instrument. Now, that's what would make it a very attractive for the UK, because the UK could say things like, OK, we accept the jurisdiction of the Court of Justice over this new legal instrument, but that's because we've agreed to it. And it's not the direct jurisdiction of the court under the old treaties. It's under this new thing that we've agreed on a time-limited basis. That's not going to be how the EU is going to want to see that. And certainly, if the dispute resolution mechanism that is put into that agreement was one that infringed upon the prerogatives of the Court of Justice, you can be pretty sure that if this was ever referred to the court, it's not going to find it easy to uh, view it as compatible with EU law. It's complex. The point being, it's risky. It's the riskier strategy to create a new, although it seems logical, you'd create the, the slimmed down version of where it is you're trying to get to, it is the one that I think is the most legally risky. So hang on, let's just go back to David Davis for a moment and his central motivation for why we need transition. And that is because we need time. So why not then, and here's our third option, Let's just delay departure. So it might simply be the simplest thing for the UK to delay withdrawal. And Article 50, I think, avails of two options in that respect. Remember, Article 50 says that the treaties cease to apply at the date of entry into force of the withdrawal agreement. So you create a date of entry into force of the withdrawal agreement that's sometime in the future. You negotiate everything within the two-year window, so up until 29th of March 2019, all signed, all sealed. It's just not going to kick in for a little bit longer. It would buy the UK time. it would be incredibly political difficult for both sides. The UK would not have left. The UK would still be a member state. It would still be subject to its obligations. It would still want to participate in the EU's institutions. And from the EU side, it's when are you going? It's like the last person at the party that you really just want to go home. You want to go to your bed and know they're still sticking around. Uh, more specifically, 2019, new elections to the European Parliament. How can you hold elections to the European Parliament when you still have British MEPs, but then they weren't going to be hanging around for that much longer? And you'd have the appointment of a new commission. Do we have a new UK commissioner? And would the UK have a role in the appointment of the new commission president? Politically, it's a car crash. It's horrible. 
The other option is that the Article 50 does allow for, by unanimity, the, the member states to agree for a, a bigger window rather than the two-year uh, time period. Again, we have the same sorts of, of problems that would arise in terms of hitting against the political cycle of the EU and the prolongation of EU membership. It is, of course, the easiest to manage in terms of the UK's withdrawal bill because all that happens is the exit day just moves further and further into the future. It's still, become, it's still a, a bright line date. It's just that it happens sometime later. But for lots of reasons, I think this type of deferral isn't really, it doesn't seem to me particularly likely. Which leads me to our last option, which is something else we know about, something else that exists out there, and that is the European Free Trade Association and its relationship with the EU through the European Economic Area Agreement. It is often said that what is required, given the time constraints, is an off-the-shelf transitional arrangement. Trying to create a bespoke transitional arrangement will be too time-consuming, too difficult, etc. whereas an off-the-shelf solution would be ideal. The UK government has been very consistent. It doesn't want this. It doesn't want the UK to rejoin EFTA. It doesn't want a, an arrangement with the EU via the European Economic Area Agreement, and for somewhat understandable reasons. One is you need to get into it in the first place. And you need to get into it by the UK being outside of the EU. So how do you transition to transition? Actually, I am optimistic about that. I don't think that's that difficult. Others, Jean-Claude uh, Pires, um, uh, a, a former EU institutional lawyer, says, no, it's, you've got to be out, it'll take time, it'll be difficult. I'm more optimistic. I, I don't think, I don't think it's, it's so difficult. But it was an arrangement that was put in place in the early 1990s. The uh, Economic Area Agreement was agreed with between the EFTA states and the EU in the early 1990s. And it hasn't really kept pace with change particularly well. It would feel like putting on, if you're, if you're putting on a, an, well, if it's not off the shelf, if it's, it's, it's pret-a-porter, it doesn't feel like it fits very well uh, as a kind of form of uh, transitional uh, clothing uh, for, 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 the, for the UK. So there's, there, there's some reasons why one can see that it's, it's not attractive. It is attractive in some, in some labor circles, not many, but some. Um, Stephen Kinnock has been particularly vocal about this as the ideal form of transitional arrangement, access to the single market. Difficulty, of course, is that with that comes free movement of workers, and there are possibilities for putting in place certain derogations on that, but they are not entirely easy. Um, it would, however, be very useful for the education and research community here in Cambridge because it would give access to things like Horizon 2020, which is one of the major funding uh, sources of which UK universities have done fairly well. So some clear uh, reasons for that type of arrangement. I think, though, in the end, it's this option. For one thing, it's outside of the Article 50 process. It's not something the Article 50 process can manage as such. It's not a transition within that framework. It would need to be something that would be negotiated and put in place as soon as the Article 50 process came to an end. And I think for many, this doesn't really look like a transition at all. Because you simply ask yourself this, if you got into that arrangement, why the hell would you leave it? What would be the incentive to leave it to something else? And if you were going to leave it to something else, what would that be? You still then need to decide what your future is going to be. So it looks more like a short and medium-term strategy. 
rather than something which is going to deal with the immediacy of Brexit and what to do. So what conclusions can we draw about transition? It seems to me that some form of standstill transition, if we're going to get one at all, is the most likely politically and the most legally plausible outcome. But even that is going to require compromise and a willingness on both sides to accept that to accept this. If this is the best option, then we also then need to prepare for the worst. In other words, if that is our best option and it is going to require compromise, and if we don't think compromise is going to be likely, then in, in fact, the no deal option is certainly something which we need to take seriously. So if this cannot be agreed, then I don't think any other option will be agreed. And it will be a very hard Brexit. Brace, brace. Thank you very much. Thank you.